are gonna get crazy! <laughs> Most everyone's mad <laughs> Greetings and salutations, everyone, and welcome to another fun-filled and exciting episode of Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast. I hope you are all having a wonderful day so far, and that right now we can go and make this one a whole lot better. And what a fascinating week that we have went through, because, well, more so than uh, most other weeks that we've been, it feels like it's been a very dry week when it comes to news. Like, it's really hard to find anything that really is worth talking about in this podcast. And I will admit, there was a part of me throughout the week that I did consider canceling this week to just give myself a break. And uh, I will confess, uh, there was a moment when I did have a burnout, so... Uh, there was even one day uh, during this week that I had to not work at all and just separate myself from my computer and just relax a little bit. And then I actually did think a little bit further, like afterwards, after I had my break and I did feel a whole lot better afterwards... It did get me thinking when I did look back throughout the week, the fact that even though we didn't have any much news, I did wonder, like, hold on a second... Um, you know what's interesting is that even though we didn't have much news, we did have a whole lot of trailers, funny enough, more so than we would than usual. So it did get me thinking, why not for this episode, we could do something a little bit special and something that I haven't done in a very long time, which is to just talk about trailers. That I have an entire collection of trailers that not all the stories I'll be covering, but most of them will be all just trailers for upcoming animated features and upcoming projects that will be coming up that I feel like would be very interesting to go and talk about here. Now, I do have one story, though. I do have one new story that I decided I'm going to go and save up for last. But in a way, what we are going to experience is a little bit like when we would be in the movie theaters. Before the movie itself would start, we would just go through a whole bunch of different trailers. So why don't we go and relive that experience except we would have that extra addition of having some time that we could go and actually discuss this. So this is going to be a very trailer-centric episode in which we are just going to be checking out all the different trailers for many upcoming and pretty exciting things to come in the world of animation. And the only thing that I'm sure won't be as exciting will be when I put this episode up on YouTube because I know that there will be some copyright claims that will be coming right at me when I would go and put this up there. <laughs> okay, but anyways, in all seriousness though, I think it's time we will go into the chat wall and I would like to ask you all, are you ready for today's episode of Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast? Let me hear it folks, are you ready? Uh, let's see. Ooh, already right now, people are just all set and prepared. And funny enough, uh, one thing I just want to add, it was pretty funny that I saw before the show got started and people were just talking amongst themselves in the chat wall. There was one person that was just asking, like, is that about a fan of Markiplier? And I just had to jump right in. I just had to have that need to just go and immediately respond and just say, like, you right. <laughs> but yeah, I definitely am a big Markiplier fan. And especially when Mark would be with Bob and Wade, those episodes are definitely a lot of fun but anyways i see that everyone is ready and now with all that said and done i think now it is time that we shall go and get things started and with our first story that we have here our first trailer is gonna be an upcoming netflix movie and some people have even said that this is technically the first original netflix animated feature that was announced and that was like way way back in i believe in like 2017 or 2018 or something like that it, it was a while ago but with this movie right now they it's netflix is hoping that this is going to be a major summer blockbuster because that's one major thing they want to go and emphasize is that this is a completely ridiculous summer blockbuster that will be up in time for the fourth of july 
So, with our first trailer, let us begin by checking out the upcoming Netflix movie, America the Motion Picture. Whoops, I almost forgot. There we go. Now you can see it. And let's go and begin. George Washington. Let's go start a fucking revolution. Ding dong! It's America, motherfucker! Did you practice that light in the car on your way here? What the fuck is a car? Holy shit. Hello, Gav. Oh, hi, Gav. I can't ask you to go in there with me. You? Yeah, good, because no. Great, good luck. Whoa, 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 whoa. Science! Science! Charge! So you want me, a black dude, to play lookout for you while you break the law? Real heavy hitters. And that was America the Motion Picture, the next animated film from Netflix that will be coming soon, uh, at least close in time for the 4th of July, a little bit earlier, but that's pretty much the big thing. And as you could definitely notice from America the Motion Picture, I think one thing it is safe to say right now is that this looks absolutely stupid. But of course, it, it, it is intentionally stupid. The whole thing with America the Motion Picture is that it's supposed to be like this entire satire of major action-packed blockbusters where you just take all the big like action movies and just crank it up by a hundred. In fact, uh, a lot of the people who are working on this, they are heavily associated with, uh, with a lot of action and this kind of comedy as well. Uh, they did state at the start that it is from the people that did brought us Archer and The Expendables. And of course, one of the big players of this, not just the star, but one of the big producers is actually Channing Tatum along with having Phil Lord and Chris Miller being uh, the producers as well. And, and I mean, these guys have been very well known right now for making like crazy and ridiculous action-packed movies, uh, rather it be stuff that they've directed or produced with like the Lego movie, Spider-Verse, or even just recently with the Mitchells versus the Machines. So with this one, it's supposed to be the kind of goofy comedy that in no way, shape, or form it's taking itself seriously. It's pretty much taking aspects of American folklore and American history and combine that to create this ridiculously big epic adventure. And one movie that I will say, I don't know what the fridge happened here. I think I clicked the wrong thing. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, but the one thing that I will say is that if there is one movie that it really does make me think of in terms of its tone, in terms of what it's really trying to do, it's that it really makes me think of Team America World Police. Because, it, like, I've already seen this in the chat wall, but a lot of people are even saying uh, that, like, it has that tone that really puts out that whole America fuck yeah and it really has that adult sensibility as well like I probably should have put out a little bit of a warning beforehand but you can hear that of course this is definitely not for kids that uh, this is very much adult oriented especially when it comes to the language and probably with the violence as well like I can imagine there might be one scene where they won't hesitate to make it like a massive gore fest or anything like that. But it, but basically the big thing with this is that it really does feel like uh, this is this whole satire on America in general. But instead of just making this whole massive uh, commentary on modern American culture and how America, like 
pretty much satirizing patriotism, this one has a more history-oriented angle. Now, I could be wrong, and there could be that satirical commentary on patriotism, but they really are leaning more, again, towards American history and American folklore, uh, where you do see characters like George Washington, John Henry, and there's even, a, at one point, where you saw this massive battle of um, Paul Bunyan versus, uh, bi like, this big mechanical... Bi uh, well, the, the London Tower, I would say. I was about to say Big Ben, but then again, it reminds me, like, oh, yeah, technically, like, Big Ben is the bell. It's not the tower. Or is it the Elizabeth Tower? Or one of the two. A anyways, um, you get what I mean. Like, the big... London slash Elizabeth Tower uh, that's now like this giant mechanical robot that's fighting against Paul Bunyan. It's really to emphasize like the ridiculousness and to emphasize like the goofy action-packed adventure, especially uh, giving the characters like some superpowers, especially with the science girl really going all out. I think... Um, like the, the like I think I remember seeing in the like they mentioned that they're gonna have like Thomas uh, Thomas Edison so maybe I think she is Thomas Edison I could be wrong but anyways um, the the whole thing is supposed to be stupid it's like yeah it's exaggerated and like you'll have like these gags and like uh, cultural references like you even got like fireworks saying don't tread on me bro with that icon of the snake and, and all that kind of stuff but. That, for me, I feel like it's going to be a bit of a conflicting thing, is that overall, just by watching this entire movie and seeing this whole stupidity, I feel like it's going to be a bit of a 50-50 kind of situation. Now, being stupid is actually a risk when you're doing that in a movie. Because, of course, there is that risk that if you want to go with a stupid tone, then you're just going to end up exactly that. You're just going to be stupid. And it's just going to really fall flat on its face, and it'll have nothing else to blame but itself but there are ways that you can take stupid and you can actually make it enjoyable and you can actually have it be uh, a great like really be beneficial for its comedy adult swim really made a business out of that especially with shows like aqua teen hunger force so chances are this could have a bit more of that adult swim style kind of comedy where it really is the kind where you just have to turn off your brain and just enjoy the ridiculous ridiculousness and the stupidity of the moment but then again I could also see where it can fall flat on his face but to its credit though I will say like there are some impressive things on it like um, one thing that I do admire is uh, actually the animation doesn't look that bad I will say there are times when like yeah it's obviously more did like 2d digital oriented um, like it's in the veins of, uh, some of the modern 2D like shows, especially the fact that like the people from Archer are working on this. And I think that is the best comparison for this kind of animation that it's very much, um, uh, Archer like in a sense. So it's basically this massive comedy and, and not to mention as well that it, since it is more animation oriented they'll go crazy with the action and uh like that you'll you'll see like this massive superhero tone especially with like with john henry with his hammer like they're like they're not hiding the fact that yeah they're kind of they're, they're kind of treating him like he's the movie's thor and even like the one image from before like they're pretty much presenting these american heroes uh like they are uh the avengers like that that's kind of the whole kind of the whole thing is to present uh, to, to, pre to present these guys as, yeah, 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 here, here's the picture right over here. It's, it's, it's to pretty much present, like, these, Amer these American icons as they are superheroes because that's what many patriotic people nowadays actually do see them as, is that for them, like, George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, like, for them, that's, like, Captain America, that's Iron Man, that's Thor, that's the Incredible Hulk and stuff like that. So, that's why, so, basically... It, it could be, like, both a celebration and a satire where, like, it goes into all these different genres and just really go crazy with it. But, yeah, overall, for me, it, it, like, I know it's just, like, a minute and a half trailer, but I think that's really the most that I could think of in terms of my opinion on this is that I feel like I could see this go 50-50, where this could either be absolutely hilarious and this could be an absolute blast, 
or it could just be too immersed in its own stupidity that the movie itself just becomes that. It's just stupid. I don't think this is going to be the kind of movie that will be for everyone, but I think it's going to be though like those who do enjoy the 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 stupidity of it, the that do enjoy the ridiculousness and doesn't take America too seriously because I can imagine those uber nationalists getting like all triggered on this and like be desperate to go cancel Netflix because of this kind of movie with the way that they're making fun of America per se. Uh but overall though I mean ultimately I feel like this is kind of a wait and see kind of thing because I could see where it could be hilariously great or it could really fall flat on its face with its own stupidity we'll we'll, we'll just have to wait and see when the movie does come out on June 30th so that's going to be when it will be released. So it's just going to be in a few weeks. But again, uh, pretty strategic in terms of that kind of release. So that pretty soon, when it'll, it, it, pretty soon it will be the 4th of July. And it will give audiences a chance to actually watch it. Uh, put some uh, word of mouth out there on social media. And see if like by the time the 4th of July could actually come out. Hopefully Netflix could actually repeat the same success as Disney Plus did last year when they released Hamilton early. So who knows? We'll see how things will go. And with that said, I would like to go into the chat wall and I would like to ask you all, how do you feel about this trailer for America, the motion picture? Did you guys like this? Uh, are you guys a little bit hesitant? Uh, what parts you like about it? What parts you didn't like about it? Let me know what you think on this. Uh, let's see now. Oh, okay. Uh, let's see. Honestly, I think this would make a better series than a movie. But other than that, I am intrigued. The animation looks decent, if a little bit cheap. And I like the idea of historical Avengers. I will definitely be checking this out when it comes out on Netflix later this summer. You know, that could be an interesting argument. And yeah, I can see where this would work out more as a series. In fact, like the whole template of it feels like, yeah, it would be made more as some kind of series. I, I do get where, where you mean by that, honestly, especially with the fact that with the materials that they could have, they could have, a like, if they do it as a series, they would have a whole lot more time to actually benefit with uh, playing around with, uh, again, with American folklore and with American history with the way that they could warp things up for their own uh, crazy blockbuster that they have in mind. Uh, let's see what else we have here. Uh, this trailer looks aggressively America than, uh, than that halfway throughout the trailer. I was expecting that Team America song to play. Uh, that's not to say it looks bad. It looks absolutely insane to the point where I kinda ob I'm kind of i kind of obligated to watch it. Uh, but with Andy Samberg being among the cast, I won't be surprised if one of the characters just quote that meme by being all, Ha ha ha, Benedict Arnold, you are begging my daughter. Uh, that would be worth the price ad of admission. Yeah, that, that is true. I mean, like, you do have a few of those, like, Lord and Miller staples. Uh, like, especially, like, you do have Chatting Tatum in there. Uh, and then, uh, of course, you also got Will Forte uh, being in there. And I believe he's also going to be voicing Abraham Lincoln, which he has a bit of a tradition playing it, especially since um, uh, one of, like, like, one of his earlier roles is actually playing Abraham Lincoln in Clone High. And he also played Lincoln once again in the Lego movie as well. So there have been there have been a few times uh, that he would play Abraham Lincoln and has now become the uh, comical staple of Abraham Lincoln when it comes to actors who would go and play them. Well, except for um, except for the one in Soul, like that guy, I forgot his name, but he would he would play Abraham Lincoln more than uh, more than uh, uh, Will Forte. But oh my god, like that that's honestly one of the funniest Abraham Lincoln moments in a movie ever. The one in Soul, like that's just beautiful right there. Uh, but anyways, uh, let's see what else we have here. Uh, if it's not too heavily in the veins of Archer, I could enjoy it. I enjoy a decent historical satire, especially animated. Uh, I can also hear it now from a particular crowd. My freedoms! Yeah, you never know. Maybe in a few weeks we will see Fox News trying to say, Netflix is putting cancel culture on America with this movie! <laughs> 
Like, I mean, you never know with Fox News or with wh- whatever far right outlets are there. Like, I mean, they love their cancel cultures and they love pointing towards anything and everything to distract people from real issues to say that cancel culture is a real problem or whatever. <laughs> oh, let's see. What else do we have? Uh, what are the comments? Uh, let's see. Hopefully the stupidity of this movie would be on a similar vein to Captain Underpants the movie or how the Muppets uh, make their takes on classic stories like Golden Touch. I mean, it could. It possibly can. But um, for me, I feel like, honestly, this is more going to be in the veins of something like Team America World Police. And I mean, there are some great moments in Team America, but I do remember watching it a few years ago. Like, I did a review of it and... I wasn't necessarily particularly a big fan of the movie as a whole. I mean, granted, there are some hilarious parts, but other than that, though, if like, I feel like that could be the worst case scenario for this movie, where it's like so into its own stupidity and its own satire, where it becomes essentially what it is sat- satirizing in itself or it's just or like it's so it's so immersed in its own satire that it doesn't really have a movie in there if you get what i mean so that could be the worst case scenario i just feel like this is going to be the like i i just feel like the worst case would be that they would take all this and they would just become too much like uh team america world police uh, let's see. I'll go and read one more comment before we jump into the next one. Uh, yeah, kind of, uh, kind of all over the top movie ain't t- uh, totally my cup of tea, but it can be enjoyable to a small portion of people. My prayers to their decaying IQs. Also, is it me or do I feel some Godzilla Final War vibes? Oh yeah, absolutely. Like they're like, I can imagine this kind of like, they will have some kind of finale where they're really going to go all out in the ridiculousness and have that giant war going on with all the different uh, folklore legends and different uh, historical figures just battling it out with uh, America versus the Brits. But uh, overall, though, if you guys are excited to check out America the Motion Picture, just remember that it's going to be out on June 30th. All right, so for the next trailer that I have over here, we're going to be sticking to a similar theme where it's not just going to be on Netflix, but we're also going to be sticking to an American theme. But this one, however, it will take itself a lot more seriously than America the Motion Picture. This is not going to be a movie or a show per se, but it's actually going to be a set of music videos in which is going to be a massive collaboration between um, music artists as well as animators and all this in order to go and promote civil rights. So with that said, let's go and check out our next trailer to which we are going to be checking out We The People. So let me go and set myself up and let's get ready. Can I make a difference if I don't even know how? Pay attention so I know my rights. Education's gonna change the cycle. I am an American citizen. This ain't just the place I'm living in. I got rights like everyone else. Like president. Okay, now let me start to tell y'all all about taxes. How much do you pay? Well, that depends on your bracket. Stay in bed in the same thing. Link up. Me and you. And that is 
is We the People, which is Netflix's animated way of promoting civil rights. And as you probably have seen throughout the credits, you actually do have a whole bunch of familiar names. Like probably the biggest one of them all is from the executive producers where you got Chris Nee, Kenya Barris, and especially Barack and Michelle Obama. So that's where you got the whole idea about this being all about civil rights. And you guys know about Barack and Michelle Obama that they are uh, some of the biggest modern advocates for civil rights, for people's right to vote, uh, for people's rights to live, for people's rights uh, to be equal as much as white people, and all those kinds of different rights that everyone have their equal ground no matter what. In Amer where, like in the United States, that people are people, nothing more and nothing less. But of course, you also got some big names that are also prominently featured with the musicians as well, where you got people such as uh, Janelle Monet, you got Adam Lambert, uh, you also got um, like probably the biggest one. It's like in the uh, second half of like the musicians list. It's like you go down right over here. And you do see a whole bunch of familiar names. Brittany Howard, Lin-Manuel Miranda, David Diggs, Kristen Anderson Lopez, and Robert Lopez. And this is uh, these are a bunch of names here that I know for Disney fans, you would definitely be excited when you see those names pop up. And it's like, oh, they're going to be involved with the music? Oh, then we're in for something good. But on top of that, we also got a few familiar names as well in terms of the animation side. Uh, where, here, let me back that up. I, I, like, you might find, like, there are a few that maybe some people might not necessarily be all that familiar, but there are some that I'm sure will pop out to you. Like, uh, <coughs> oh, excuse me. Like, number one, a major one here is actually the first is Peter Ramsey. And you guys know Peter Ramsey, the Oscar-winning animation director of such films like Rise of the Guardians and Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. So he's actually going to be working on this uh, project. And of course, you got uh, animation's favorite Mexican, Jorge Gutierrez, that's also working on this. And one that personally did surprise me that I saw in terms of the names here is actually Tim Rauch. And maybe you don't necessarily know Tim Rauch, but for me, I remember Tim Rauch that um, a few years ago, I think before this podcast, before Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast, I remember I actually talked to this guy. Like, I had him as a guest, and uh, I talked to him about this uh, special indie project that he had, like this special little uh, animated short, or I think an animated series that he has um, ready to go and work on. So it's kind of surprising to see uh, someone like uh, like Tim that uh, I remember talking to once, and now, like, uh, he got up in the ranks of being a, a Netflix director, like right up there with Peter Ramsey and Jorge Gutierrez, working on this project in particular. So the big thing that I do want to emphasize with this is regarding the fact that uh, there are a lot of familiar names, like maybe not all of them, but there will be some that will definitely pop out for you. And of course, uh, the biggest thing about this is that I, I think the best way to describe this project from what this trailer is showing us is that essentially this is a lot like uh, a de like, I wouldn't say America, but a more democracy version of Fantasia, in a sense. I think that's the best way to put it. Because this is a combination of music, of animation, and of course, of civil rights. Where you do have the music that is, that's uh, taking over the flow of the narrative that's going on in the shorts. Uh, and then you have the animation that visually presents what is happening. And then, of course, civil rights, which puts in the theme of these narratives, what these stories are about in the first place. Uh, rather it be about your rights, uh, rather it be about, um, about democracy, about paying your taxes, you know, to have more of an understanding about how the American system works. And in a way, um, like, it's not necessarily just about America. Like, there are a few moments where they do hint out that this is more about democracy all around the world. And I think, like, a good example is when you see a little bit of the, um, like, when, when you see the Jorge Gutierrez section uh, where you have uh, Bibi, Re uh, Bibi Rexha, I think that's how you say her name, but um, uh, the Jorge Gutierrez sec segment is going to be called American Citizen, and as you can see... American 
like they would go and emphasize like the, the like the the big thing the the big theme of this is basically immigrants that no matter where you are born uh, like when you're in America, you are considered an American citizen, no matter what. Like, like if you are born, like if you are from South Africa, uh, or if you're in Thailand, or if you're in Haiti, or if you're in Ecuador, and that's just uh, a few examples. And even like a little later on, like with France as well. So basically, that is a com So basically, with this one is a commentary on immigration, and that yes, you can still be considered uh, an a, an American citizen, where where you have your equal amount of rights as much as someone who is born in America, uh, in in order to go and vote and stuff like that. So it's ba basically more for a, a sake of empowerment. And then you also got another segment like where they talk about taxes and. Um, and then there's another one like with uh, the Peter Ramsey segment about change because that's also going to be another major thing and maybe a little bit of a controversial aspect is that this is going to be something that will not be afraid to get into hot button topics because we all know that there have been some controversial uh, aspects when it comes to social issues especially in recent years uh, rather it be about black rights uh, that did launch the Black Lives Matter movement and other uh, and other movements as well uh, that promote the rights and to help out people of color from white discrimination such or, well discrimination from white people I meant to say uh, such as stop Asian hate and stuff like that and even um, the discriminate and, and even right now like there have been a lot of battles and a lot of debates about abortion right now uh, that is another hot button topic so it would go into women's rights as well uh, and not to mention voting rights especially with the way like we have seen right now how uh, Republican politicians Politicians are desperately trying to take down democracy by putting Jim Crow style uh, voting restrict uh, voter restriction laws. So that's also going to be uh, another topic that they will really get into in order to go and promote people's rights to vote and to fight against those nationalists that are trying to fight against those civil rights. So th that's basically the big thing that they want to go and emphasize. And I can imagine how this will be pretty controversial, especially with the fact that this is going to be something that will be executive produced by Barack Obama. And you know, there are those racist people out there that have this serious grudge against Obama. Like, yeah, they'll, they'll like those people can go and bitch about how some people in the left can't let go of Donald Trump, but my God, like some, like some of these uh, conservatives and some of these Republicans, like to this day, they still cannot let go of either Obama or even Hillary Clinton. So who the hell are they to speak about, like letting letting go of a grudge or something like that? But yeah, like there will be, uh, the like this will have some controversy when this will make it on Netflix and when this will be public. That like you could probably hear like a lot of outrage going on, and I it, like you could actually see it already happening right now. Uh, when you do look, um, like just uh, refresh the uh, video for a little bit, and like you could see it a little bit already happening. Uh, on the video itself, like I'm using YouTube to to present this trailer. And you can see in terms of the likes and dislikes that you got uh, you got around 3.5 uh, like uh, 3,500 likes versus nearly 1,000 dislikes. So there are already some people that are pushing back against this because this trailer is not afraid to go and discuss about those civil rights and that there are those people that are not on the side of civil rights. Rather it be stuff about uh, about women's rights, uh, especially about racial equality or even people's rights to vote and even immigration and stuff like that this will be like this will definitely be something that will trigger some nationalists so yeah it will be controversial but then again nowadays i could see how uh this series well i guess i don't know if i could really say series but it is going to be a set of 10 different uh music uh, 10 different music videos like it will stir some controversy but i could see how this is important especially when these hot button topics are pretty uh big right now and that they really are worth discussing so overall though uh, overall, I would say that this is actually pretty interesting. I, I, I will say, I, like, I'll probably keep my eye out on a few of them, especially, like, 
Like, I, I will be interested in seeing stuff like the uh, Peter Ramsey segment, the Jorge Gutierrez one, and especially the one from uh, the Lopez's and Lin-Manuel Miranda. Like, those I'll definitely be interested in seeing, but we'll see how it goes with how We the People will impact Netflix. And uh, I don't know if we have an official release date as of yet. Um, I don't, did, did they say when this is coming out? Uh, oh yes, actually, uh, they did confirm it. Actually, it will be out on the 4th of July, so I guess that is a pretty fitting, uh, thing to put this out on 4th, uh, to put out on the 4th of July, you know, have the funny satirical one, like, a little bit beforehand, but then you have the real serious topics to come out on the Day of America, so that does make sense, so it, it looks interesting, I'll, I'll give it that, so we'll see how it goes later. Okay, so with that said, uh, let us go into the chat wall, and I would like to ask you all, how do you feel about We the People? Are you guys interested in seeing it? Is there a particular segment that you would be most willing to check out, or are you just going to go and give this a pass? Let me know what you all think on this. <clears throat> Okay, let's see now. Netflix, take my money. Uh, I, um, this looks like a fun, artsy ride of music videos. I'm excited for all these and Netflix being all about experimental animation projects. Uh, I was almost thinking it reminds me of The Prophet, where there's these short animations set to poetry with different animation styles and directors. American Citizen, more believable than the French person... Uh, would be treated like an American citizen than the Thai, Haitian, and Ecuadorian people in that montage. Can't wait. And you know, honestly, that is actually a very fair comparison. That is actually true. If you guys have, uh, haven't have seen The Prophet, if you don't know what it is, uh, I actually do have it right here. I just need to remember where did I... Uh, where is it? Ah, yes. Okay, yeah. Yeah, this is uh, Khalil... Yeah, Khalil Gibran's The Prophet. This is actually an amazing animated feature. I highly recommend to check it out. Uh, I highly recommend you to go and see this one if you haven't. It's a, it's a beautiful animated feature. And um, in, in a way, it, it's actually kind of like a, this celebration of animation where you do have a whole lot of uh, different animators that worked on this. Like you got Cartoon Saloon who worked on it. You got uh, Bill Plimpton who worked on this. Uh, not to mention, this is all direct directed by uh, is it Roger Moore I believe um, yeah like one of the direct one of the directors of uh, the Lion King Roger Moore uh, he actually worked on this and it turned out to be such an amazing animated feature and it is a good uh, a good um, it is a good example that you did bring up that of the fact that like yeah it's like all these different uh, animators coming together uh, to bring uh, the poem to life but instead of poems uh, in this case with we the people, they would go and talk about American, uh, about civil rights in America. So that is actually a pretty solid example and really glad that you did bring it up. Uh, let's see, what else do we have here? Now, this looks more promising than the previous trailer. In a time of po political turmoil like no other, not only in the U.S., but all around the world, this kind of musical project is an excellent opportunity to reinstate the most basic civil rights that are common all at, uh, at around all countries. Also, being part of a nationality doesn't strip your humanity away, nor does religion and political affiliation. We all were, are, and will continue to be human citizens. Definitely a nice message you got there. Too bad not many have that in mind. So, uh, let's see. Uh, what else do we have here? I didn't know what to expect, but I gotta say, I'm kind of blown away. The lineup of both singers and directors is absolutely banging. The songs are pretty solid so far. The intentions of the series is pretty powerful. And I could gush about the visual style for Eon. So, I'll definitely be checking this out. Especially since we got more Lin-Manuel Miranda and David Diggs content. Which is always a good time. Exactly, man. You know, and, and honestly, even for me, I feel like the more I think of this, the more I feel like, yeah, this is going to be controversial, but I feel like this is going to be uh, some of the most important animation content that they are going to be bringing out. So honestly, I definitely do applaud Netflix for making something like this. Uh, let's see now.
I'm gonna be on uh, I I've got to be honest here yes the animation in this looks great and the soundtrack is amazing uh, the only thing that's kind of a turnoff for me is that it's not really into the I I'm not really into the psychedelic stuff but that might be just me so while I will probably get the soundtrack I think I'll pass on uh, watching this. You know what, that's that's a fair argument. That is pretty fair, and I mean, I understand that the whole psychedelic thing is not necessarily for any for everyone. For me, I definitely dig the psychedelic. I love it, and especially one of my favorite animated features ever is Yellow Submarine, and it's hard to be any more psychedelic than that. So, uh, yeah, like, if you, it is true that if you're not into the psychedelic, then maybe this whole series might not necessarily be for you, because when it comes to animated music videos, they usually tend to go a lot more into the abstract and into the psychedelic. You know, it's, it's a way to be artistically more poetic, in a way. <laughs> it, it's weird, but, I mean, that's usually the excuse, so people would just go with that. Uh, anyways, um... What else do we have here? Uh, there are two people involved in this production that automatically make me want to take a peek at this movie as soon as possible. Uh, Darren, ne ne uh, Nefke uh, Darren Nefke, the creator of Star vs. the Forces of Evil, and of course Lin-Manuel Miranda. Funny enough, I at one point, I myself did uh, think a film in a similar, sis uh, similar style to this in Fantasia, except it was more decades and century based, though um, it never went anywhere. Okay, fair enough. Uh, let's see if we have... Roger Allers! Okay, someone did correct me. Thank you. It's not Roger Moore. It's Roger Allers. Thank you so much. Okay. All right, so I got it. <laughs> thank, you, thank you for correcting me on that one. Uh, all right, I'll read one more comment before we jump into the next one. Uh, this seems really fascinating. It will be interesting to see all of these different animators and musicians to show us the importance of civil rights. I do enjoy watching animated music videos, so I'll try to check this out when I can. Some people might be shocked that the Obamas will be involved in this, but I still remember where, uh, where, oh, when Michelle was in a promo for Penguins of Madagascar. Yeah, that, that, that was definitely a thing, all right. You got the, yeah, the, the, the first lady promoting Penguins of Madagascar. But then again, considering Jeffrey Katzenberg's strong affiliation with the Democratic Party, I'm honestly really not that surprised that it even happened in the first place. So yeah, if you guys are interested in checking out We The People, then just remember that the music videos will be coming out on the 4th of July. So if you don't have any other plans on that day other than your barbecues and family reunions and stuff like that, then you could consider taking some time checking out some really cool and really trippy music videos. Alright, so... Now let's go and take a little break from America stuff and let's actually move on to another country where we are going to be heading to Japan and we got a brand new animated feature from a name that's becoming more and more acclaimed as a Japanese filmmaker, Mamoru Hosoda. Yes, he is back in order to create another digitally themed animated feature. And with that said, let us go ahead and check out the trailer on on his next movie, which is going to be called Bell. Hold on a sec. I just need to go and reload. Uh, this is not from YouTube, by the way. This is on Vimeo that I found. So let's go and check this one out. Wait! 
たな泣いてばかりいる自分に戻っていいのそれでもいいのいやーすずーはい。Uh, an ad- yeah, this is basically going to be、uh, th- this new modern adaptation of Beauty and the Beast, especially when you do have a main character like Belle, and then you encounter another character that is the Beast. And I will say, in terms of that, I feel like, yeah, they are doing another adaptation of it, but there definitely is a lot more layers to it, especially、uh, in terms of adding in that digital world aspect. And honestly, in my little research, in knowing a bit more about、uh, Mamoru Hosoda and what he has done over the years, I-, I-, I kind of find it funny because I feel like that seems to be a bit of his、uh, auteurism in a way. Because it's funny how Mamoru Hosoda really loves to go into the digital world. Because if you guys don't know, Mamoru Hosoda has directed a whole bunch of these types of films,、uh, like, uh, like the, the kind that、uh, is not afraid to go into this like, sci fi or fantasy element, like to give it a really good supernatural twist in a sense.、Uh, movie, like, he's the guy who directed movies like The Girl Who Leapt Through Time, Summer Wars, The Boy and the Beast, Wolf Children, and even received an Oscar nomination for Mirai. And now he's going to be coming in with Belle. And it's not just the fact. Fact that he directed、uh, Summer Wars, where I do see the comparison. Because if you guys don't know, Mamoru Hosoda is also a Digimon veteran. This is a guy whom、uh, his directing experience really goes extensive in terms of the Digimon series, like not just the main ones,、uh, but also like a few of the other spin offs、uh, that would go on、uh, later after the first series. And、um, I-, I believe it, like his directing. Directorial debut was actually working in one of the segments of Digimon the movie as well. So that's why I do kind of find it funny where、um, the guy can just never escape the digital world, rather it be working on Digimon or even doing his own feature films like Summer Wars or what we are seeing in Bell. And I mean, that's not the only things that he has done, of course, of, like even beforehand, before he fully became a director,、uh, he was also a key animator in several Dragon Ball series as well. So that's,、uh, that's one thing that I thought I would go and、uh, mention that is very fascinating and kind of funny that, like, you know, when it's Mamoru Hosoda, because, like, who else would really love to get into the digital world more than him? <laughs> But there is also another thing、uh, that I do find very fascinating with the movie as well, and that is regarding the animation. I actually do find it very clever the way that、uh, they, do, they have, like, the traditional hand drawn animation when you're in the real world, and then when you're in the digital world, World, you have this,、um, like, the, not just this very fantasy like, but a more,、uh, the, this computer animated digital world, like, really emphasizing the digital aspect of it all. And one thing that for me actually really does stand out, and what, like, one of the major things that I have learned about this、uh, movie in particular, I just need to make sure I find the,、uh, the right place.、Uh, nope, no, no, not here. I just want to find a good picture of her. It's actually regarding the Belle character.、Uh, there's this one moment that I need to find, at least. Like, just, like, you'll actually have. Okay, I'll, I'll go with this one right over here. Because the thing is,、um, there's something about this Belle character that really does stand out. I know some of you might be thinking, it's like, oh, well, is it because she's very pretty? Well, okay, yeah, she's definitely hot. I won't deny that. But the thing is, is that with this Belle character, she actually has this beauty that is very reminiscent to a Disney princess in a way. And it's kind of funny to mention that because that is not an inaccurate thing to say. Because one of the lead character designers of this movie is actually Jin Kim. And if you don't know Jim Kin, he's actually a veteran animator from South Korea who actually has an extensive career at Disney. 
Uh, over the years and over the decades, he actually worked on several different Disney animated features, and it wasn't until in the 2010s where he really made himself prominent with these movies where he became a character designer. It is because of his designs where we ended up with characters from Tangled, with uh, Zootopia, with Moana, with Big Hero 6, and probably his biggest contribution and probably the most recognizable work that he has done the Frozen movies. And when you do look at this Belle character, she really does look like the kind of character that like, you could take her and you could put her in the Frozen movies and she would not seem out of place at all. And, and that's what I find to be very fascinating. And like, you can even see some of that design as well, not just on her, but like with um, the other digital characters as well. Like when you're, when you are like fully immersed in the uh, digital world, <laughs> but I, I will say, yeah, like in, like in this part over here, like you do see like some of the other designs that like are a lot more stylized, a lot more different as well. But you do see a bit of that Jim Kin touch uh, that is put upon it. So uh, definitely a fascinating fact uh, to get into it where you do see like even in anime, they would have that touch of Disney. And in this case, it's a, a touch of that modern Disney uh, coming from the guy whom debatably could be said to have defined uh, the 2010 look of Disney's animated features. But um, honestly, with this digital world, like I said before, uh, what I do find fascinating is that this definitely does give that extra layer uh, for the uh, for the story as well. That it's not just the straightforward Beauty and the Beast story uh, in which the the Bell character is this uh, Hatsune Miku like digital girl uh, that is actually just your typical uh, country high schools uh, high school girl. You know, it's more than just that, but with the digital aspect, it kind of adds this additional layer uh, where, like, it, it's about this identity, where it's not just about Belle, but it's about uh, the main character, uh, Suzu, I believe? That's what they keep on saying? Uh, uh, hold on a sec. Yeah, it's uh, a secret. It's strictly mine. I was like, yeah, it's like... Yeah, Suzu. Yeah, exactly. It's about the main character, Suzu, about finding her own identity in the real world while she is secretly this Hatsune Miku-style uh, online sensation as Belle. So it, it, it's honestly uh, a, a pretty fascinating look, and I feel like there there's going to be uh, a lot of layers into this movie. So honestly, overall, I feel like in terms of the international animated features, Belle might be one that we should probably keep an eye out for. This is going to be one of those international animated features that um, that is really going to be prominent, and I'm sure that this is going to be the kind that we will be possibly hearing more during award season like I, I could see how this could even be like an Oscar uh, an Oscar contender as like your uh, temple like you know have your staple uh, in, in independent animated feature like the ones not from the mainstream studios so Honestly, I could see this go extremely well, and especially with someone like Mamoru Hosoda, uh, who has gotten like a great reputation, especially with uh, movies that have a lot of fanfare and a lot of great acclaim, uh, such as Mirai, and especially with Wolf Children. I think, honestly, this one could actually go extremely well with it. It looks visually stunning. Uh, the story actually does have a pretty good hook with, like, with this modern twist of Beauty and the Beast, but give it that extra layer. Uh, so honestly, I think we could see uh, a, like there might be a lot more to uh, this series, uh, to, to this movie, honestly. So with that said and done, I would like to go into the chat wall and I would like to go and ask you all, how do you feel about this trailer of Bell? Is this a movie that you would be interested in checking out? Um, are, are you excited to see Mamoru Hosoda's next movie? Or is there something that you feel like is a bit off and you're not interested in it? In it? Uh, let me know what you think. Okay. <clears throat> Ah, uh, let's see. <laughs> oh boy, someone wants to make a musical number out of this. All right, so let's see. Um, how do I describe this trailer? Hmm, let me try this. 
There goes the trailer with this lovely visuals, a plot that goes where no one tells. And the emotions don't lose steam, even though it crashed the stream. Overall, I'm pretty hyped to check out Bell. Yeah, thanks. You gotta go and add that in, didn't ya? <laughs> How, and I'll, also I just realized, how ironic is it, is that it's the one movie about the digital world. I think, you know what? You know what? I think I just realized something. You know who crashed my stream? It's, th it's this freak of nature right over here. It's the freaking beast. It's this guy. This is why, you know, this is why he's considered the massive enemy of this digital world. He would go and crash streams, and right when I would try to play this trailer, this dude right over here crashed my entire stream and crashed my entire freaking computer. It's because of this guy right over here. <laughs> oh boy, I think I'm starting to lose my mind right now. But then again, it's Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast, and that's very much common in this place. All right, uh, let's see. Um... What else do we have here now? Honestly, this looks like a, st a Studio Ghibli film, but this is from a different Japanese animation studio, and the fact that Jin Kim, who worked on Disney, was involved in this, I am optimistic about Bell. All right, that is nice. Let's see. So is official, 2021 is an amazing year for animated films, much better than 2020 and 2019. I loved Wolf Children, and it is one of my favorite animated films, um, one of my favorite anime, but I'm also excited to, to, I'm also excited about how he got a Disney animator to do the character design and cartoon saloon. Hosoda seems to be really reaching for ambition. Uh, Hosoda apparently is a fan of Disney's Beauty and the Beast, so that might be why it has comparisons. Uh, I hope to see it somewhere. Well, actually, I think I do remember reading a story about how uh, Jim Kim, uh, Jin Kim and Mamoru Hosoda met up. I think it was back during uh, the Oscars, back when uh, it was not when Mirai was nominated for Best Animated Feature, and uh, he was meet, and uh, the two just suddenly met, and they actually really do admire each other's work. Where Mamoru, Mamoru Hosoda really admired the character designs that he did for Disney films like Frozen and Big Hero Six, while while uh, Jin Kim really admires Mamoru Hosoda for the movies that he's done, like Mirai, Wolf Children, Summer Wars, and all that kind of stuff, and that's when they agreed to go and collaborate on a movie, and that's exactly what happened here. So I think it really is because of the connections, especially what really helped out with uh, Mirai and that Oscar nomination, uh, that gave Mamoru Hosoda the opportunity to really go networking with many of the other re uh, big names in animation and to go and work on this special project. Uh, let's see now. This looks pretty promising. I do enjoy some of Mamoru Hosoda's films like Wolf Children, Mirai, and Digimon the Movie, so I might go and give this a watch. The animation that merged with 2D and 3D looks smooth and amazing. I hope this movie will gain high praise and hopefully it might get nominated. And I have two questions to ask you. Uh, does the background at 113 look like Paprika to you? And speaking of Digimon, who was your Digimon crush? Oh my god, honestly, it's been so long since I've watched Digimon. Like, I'll just give you my back, uh, like, my background on Digimon. I, I used to be huge on Digimon, like, almost as much as Pokemon. And I remember I used to watch, like, so, like, I loved watching the first series, uh, the first series with, uh, Ty and the gang. Uh, I watched the second series, and then, I uh, like, I watched the third series, and that's when I stopped. That's when, like, in the third series, that's when they, they went into some interesting directions. Freaky directions that, like, even scared me when I was a kid, but still some pretty freaky directions there. Uh, but I, I don't remember... Man, it's been so long, but um, I don't I don't recall like me like I think I remember Mimi being pretty cute. Like I, I think I would like if I would have a crush, I think I would have to go and admit maybe it would be Mimi as my Digimon crush. I th that th I think it's been so long since I've seen Digimon, so like I can't really confirm it. But if I would, maybe I'll go with Mimi. Uh, but anyways, uh, the background reminding me of one thirteen. So let me just go and uh, yeah, let me just go and yeah, go up to here. Yeah, does okay. So basically, the person is also asking me if. This part right over here uh, reminds me of Paprika. Um, honestly, I would have to say, like, I get what you mean by the comparison, but honestly, not really. 
Because this looks a little bit more organized than Paprika. Pa Paprika, like, yeah, they would have, like, a lot, like, they would have, like, massive quantities of different, like, objects and characters all appearing in one screen in a very impressive way. But Paprika is a lot more chaotic. It's supposed to be a lot more crazy. This one here, however, like, with Belle, like, in this shot... It feels a lot more organized. Like, you could tell that there is a plan that is going on. But then again, this is just seeing the trailer and not the whole movie itself. Alright, so let's go and read one more comment before we jump into the next one. Uh, while I don't watch a lot of anime, I do admire how great this animation is. Uh, dare I say that it is uh, a better looking film than Ralph Breaks the Internet. Mmm. I don't know. Well, I mean, like, the animation is great, but this is not to say Ralph Breaks the Internet doesn't look bad. I mean, like, say what you will about that movie, but, I mean, the animation in that film is massively impressive and absolutely gorgeous. So, it's like, it's, you know, honestly, it's it's hard to beat, honestly. So, I mean, like, I would just say they're both fantastic. Uh, anyways, uh, by the way, uh, this, is one, uh, this one's a joke, but now that we are getting an animated movie called Bell Main in Japan, now we need another Japanese animated movie called Beast. Well, I mean, that would just be the spin-off film. If, if, like, Bill is such a massive success and they would do, like, some kind of prequel about, like, the Beast in that movie's origin story, then that could also be a possibility. But, yes, um, I don't know if we do have a confirmed release date on when this is going to be coming out in the West, but, yeah, honestly, I, I'm just going to say right now, keep your eyes out on this Bell movie because I don't think this is going to be the last time we'll be hearing about this. All right, folks, now, when it comes to our next trailer that we have here, this is going to be something that I believe we all need to go and admit to ourselves that um, a lot of people are saying and already trying to go and predict what is going to be the greatest animated movie of 2021, the best animated film of the year. And so far from what I've seen, all the answers are honestly wrong. Like, and I'm not saying that as my opinion. You are all factually wrong. It is not Ryan the Last Dragon. It is not the Mitchells versus the Machines. And some people are expecting it. And even though there are some great reviews already coming out of this film, it is not going to be Luca. Because we all know the true answer in our hearts. We all know what will objectively be the greatest animated film of the year or maybe even the decade. And the only real answer and the only truth is... Paw Patrol the movie! Paw Patrol is on a roll! <laughs> when all hope seems lost... Let's get out of here! When heroes... Help! ...are needed more than ever... Ah! Our fate is in their... ...paws. A dog? Actually, sir, I'm a puppy. That's even worse. You're in shock, so I'm not going to take that personally. This summer... Another perfect rescue. The worldwide phenomenon... Ow, 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 ...will ow. be unleashed on the big screen. Cause no Paw Patrol, what's your emergency? My name is Liberty. We need your help. Humdinger is going to destroy Adventure City. <laughs> Come on, pups. Adventure City's in trouble. Whoa. Welcome to our Whoa. new headquarters. So cool! There's even a new and improved pup tree dispenser. What? It's a beautiful thing. No dog. By order of the new mayor. He's more of a cat person. Ladies and gentlemen, and most importantly, influencers with over 10,000 followers. Time to light up the sky! We've got to rescue those people. Let's get to work. I need help. Paw Patrol is on a roll. Are you kidding me? I got this. Get out of the way. Move. You got to know how to talk to people. Now go. I need help. Let's kick the tires and fight some fires. Ride a cowboy. Motorcycle deployed. This is what we do. No city's too big. No pups too small. Deploy wedgie drone. Ah! Ah! Woo, yikes. Oh, yeah, boy. Spider-Verse got nothing on the 
might of Paw Patrol. Okay, n <clears throat> anyways, in all seriousness, though, all jokes aside on this, so I think it is safe to say that I have not seen Paw Patrol, honestly. I have never watched a single episode, and that's because, well, I'm 28 years old. <laughs> I'm not five, honestly. <laughs> no, but honestly, like, Paw Patrol was never really something that uh, has interest me, considering that it is more of a preschool show kind of thing. And I mean, like, you know, there, I have nothing against Paw Patrol. Like, it, it, you know, it does its own thing, and that's perfectly fine. And, like, it has gotten some very massive success to the point of becoming one of the biggest uh, preschool shows in our time right now and for that I do applaud for its accomplishment even to the point of having a big screen animated feature coming up and that is honestly something that very few preschool shows could even have that merit could even have that title I mean yeah like you do have stuff like uh recently what we had with Dora the Explorer but that doesn't really count but I mean like a direct adaptation from going like what they have on the TV show to the movie right over here. So, like, that that's definitely a major step and a, a major uh, chapter into uh, the history of Paw Patrol. So, honestly, I say great on the, uh, on the franchise to actually make it to this moment. Like, usually, th whenever they would have a movie, it would be only for TV or direct-to-home media, but, like, a big screen one that they would release worldwide and stuff like that... That, that's honestly a major deal. But with that said, though, looking into this trailer, yeah, I think it's safe to say that it knows its audience. Like, it's for, like, this is definitely for Paw Patrol fans. And the biggest proof of that is, honestly, when you go and check out the, um, like, it, it, it's honestly regarding the tone of it all. Like, I, I think the biggest example is, like, at this part. <laughs> Come on, pups. Adventure City's in trouble. <laughs> like, seriously, it, it really has that tone where, like, you'd expect it out of a satire. Like, this is the tone that you'd expect making fun of kids' movies. Like, seriously, the kid is like, come on, pups. The city is in trouble. Let's go and save the day. <laughs> Like, it really has that kind of, like, soft-spoken, talking-down kind of attitude that, yeah, it's not really going to be the kind of thing that childless millennials are really going to go and rush their way into seeing this in the same style that they're most likely going to do with something like uh, Space Jam A New Legacy. Like, this is made for the Paw Patrol audience. It's made for the same target audience that is for Paw Patrol, and they would put it here. And one thing that I will say that I actually do find to be very interesting with this is honestly regarding the animation. Like, you could obviously tell that, you know, they really stepped it up compared to uh, what they would present in the uh, animated show, but still stay true to the style and the designs of the original series. And yeah, you know, this is definitely a step in the right direction. But what I do find fascinating is when you do take a look at the vehicles, like there's something that you may notice that is a little bit different, and that is regarding the textures. Because they don't look like legitimate cars, in a way. They actually do look like toys. So it's like, this is legitimately toys coming to life. Like, probably one of the best examples is with, um, with the ranger dog over here, with this one. Cowboy! Like, you look at it, it, look, it really does look like a legitimate living toy right over here, especially with the use of colors, uh, and especially with the textures where they look more like plastic than they actually do metal in a way. And that is actually a very interesting detail uh, that I see that they added in. And yeah, like some people say that, like, in a way, it's Paw Patrol the movie is just this dumb soulless product that's just meant to sell toys, but... It's kind of interesting the way that they are presenting it here where it, it in a sense, it does feel like a legitimate car commercial, not a car commercial, but it does feel like a legitimate toy commercial where they are literally bringing the toys to life. And in a way, I find that actually interesting, but the more I think about it, the more it's kind of smart in a way, because this is supposed to be for kids in a sense, and it's about like... The, the thing is, is that this is a movie made for children. And by presenting uh, the vehicles in there as the same thing as the toys, then it would help out with their 
imagination. So, like, honestly, it's a way of, like, trying to sell the toys, but at the same time, not directly selling the toys. It, it, it's kind of like the same strategy that they would do with uh, the Lego movie, to sell merchandise without directly selling merchandise uh, to the audience. So, honestly, it's a, it's a fascinating detail that I feel like it's, it's, it's just interesting to see, like, how much they would go into that and like really make it look like a toy more so than an actual vehicle. So honestly, very, very interesting to say the least. And yeah, I mean, other than that though, what else can I say? It's, it's, it's freaking Paw Patrol. And especially like with the kind of gags that they do have, it, 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 it it's like, you know, it's for them, especially like right at the end where like, it kind of feels, it's like, okay, this right here, I feel like this is kind of dumb because I feel like this is a th this is like a major spoiler. Like after you see the Paw Patrol movie title, suddenly the villain is going away. And oh. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Yikes! Like okay, I think we just had a bit of a spoiler. Like the bit of the a little bit of the comeuppance of the bad guy because that's supposed to be the villain who wants to try to destroy the city and stuff like that. And he ends up getting a massive wedgie to the point that his pants end up getting ripped off uh, off of his body and stuff like that so uh, like honestly i feel like we might have a little bit of a spoiler but of course i mean this, this is the kind of movie that like it's not gonna give us a bad ending of course like the paw patrol has got to freaking save the day and stuff like that and that's also another really stupid thing as well it's just like really the villain that is much more of a cat person because of course we gotta have like that freaking cats versus dog kind of dynamic you know honestly like I, I feel like they're really trying to go and that's you know that really is kind of the funny thing because with the thing with what they're doing with the villain being more of a cat person it really just it really feels like it's trying to be this preschool version of Isle of Dogs in a way that that really is the best way to put it it's like Paw Patrol the movie is oddly enough the preschool version of of Isle of Dogs, because you got the villains that are more into cats, and the main characters are all dogs. So, overall, I will say that it does look impressive for what it's trying to do. The animation, I will give it, actually looks pretty top-notch right over here. There's a lot of strong effort put into this, but it's very much obvious that they're doing it for kids. It knows who's its, who its target audience are. It knows that it is for Paw Patrol fans. And it's made... Es Ooh, excuse me. It is made especially for them. No exceptions. I don't think this is really going to be the kind of movie that, like, you know, you know, someone my age or some 30-year-old is going to go watch this on a big screen being hyped up for Paw Patrol the movie. Because if that is the case, then there will be questions that shall be raised. Uh, but, um... Yeah, honestly, what else can I say? It's it's freaking Paw Patrol the movie. It's for kids. It's going to be their thing. And honestly, with what they are supplying here and what they are showing us through the trailer, I think it's going to be something they will definitely enjoy. Like, if they like Paw Patrol the series, they're definitely going to love Paw Patrol the movie. Uh, so with that said, let us go into the chat wall. And I would like to go and ask you all, how do you feel about the Paw Patrol movie trailer. Um, do you think this might interest you, actually? Uh, do you think the kids are going to love it? Do you think it's it looks like crap? Let me know what you think on this. Uh, let's see. Well, someone just pointed out, Paw Patrol the movie, mostly harmless. Yeah, I think that's really the best way to put it. Like, for adults, it's going to be harmless, so I, I don't think this is really going to be something to really rage over, or, like, I, like, I even saw some people that are, like, that are asking me, like, like, someone saying, like, oh, are you going to give it the animate seal of garbage? Are you going to go on a massive, like, hate rant and really bash this movie? And it's like, no, it's freaking Paw Patrol, man. It's for kids. It's for them. Like, who cares, really? Like... I mean, if, if if the target audience loves it, then is there really that, like, especially when it is for, like, toddlers and for, like, the youngest uh, target demographic you could think of, then is it really worth putting so much hate over? Nah, not really. Uh, let's see now. 
For a movie meant for little kids, this actually looks kind of good. The visuals are very nice, and the animation is pretty decent. The story and characters are nothing special, but what do you expect out of a movie for kids? I got to ask, though, what is it with animated movies and villainizing cats? I honestly don't know. I mean, some people, like, I, like honestly, I could just wait a little bit and, like, give it five seconds. I'm sure someone will think up of a, of a joke related to the two, 2019 Cats movie. Like, I know that's gonna be, I know people are gonna, gonna go and do that. Uh, but other than that, though, honestly, I don't know, honestly, like, I, like, I, I guess it's really the dynamic of cats versus dogs. That's always been, like, something that's been on audiences' minds for, like, many years and many decades even, so I think it's just really playing with that dynamic, and it's really easy to make dogs, like, the main characters and the heroes of the, uh, uh, of, like, the adventure and stuff like that, but I, I will say, like, I know, like, I did bring up, uh, Isle of Dogs, for example, but they don't really do much with the cats. It really is primarily just about the dogs. It just so happens that the actual villains are more into cats, so, like, really, the cats are just more of an excuse to just put in a bit of hate onto the, uh, on the villain to say, I hate dogs, and, like, what, 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 what would be an easier way to say, I'm a dog hater than to say I'm more into cats. You know, I think that, like, at least that's my theory. Uh, let's see now. Even though this looks more like it belongs to Netflix rather than in theaters, I think this looks cute. The animation looks great, and there were several moments where I laughed out loud, like the part where one of the characters said, Hey, you're, you're in shock, so I'm not going to take it personally. Uh, I think I'm most likely to watch this out of curiosity. Also, after seeing the, the cast in this movie, all I could say is, holy crap. Yeah, that's also another thing about Paw Patrol the movie, is the fact that it has so many recognizable names. Uh, the, like, the fact that they, they, they have so many people that, like, yeah, you would immediately recognize who they are. Like, they got people like uh, Dax Shepard, Tyler Perry, Jimmy Kimmel, and they even got Kim Kardashian. Although the one thing that I will say is a bit of a massive yikes in this is the fact that they credit her as Kim Kardashian West. And considering what's recently been going on with uh, Kanye and Kim, I feel like that is a bit of a yikes. I think you need to take out that uh, West uh, title in the, in her credit. You know, you need to take out the West in that thing and just keep it as uh, Kim Kardashian, at least for her sake, because... Poor girl, she really went through a lot. I know, like, we've all done, like, those stupid Kardashian jokes once in a while, but what 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 Kim Kardashian went through with Kanye West is definitely no laughing matter. Uh, let's see, what else do we have here? Um, while I don't have anything against Paw Patrol, since it is a harmless kid show, this movie is absolutely not for me. While I do think the animation looks like an update from the series, it seems like it's only aiming for fans of the show. Also, I do think releasing the film on Paramount Plus at the same time is a good strategy, so Paramount won't risk it uh, to have this be uh, to be one of their bigger and more. Oh, to, uh, to on. Oh, sorry. Uh, I know I'm stumbling on my words, but anyways, uh, this is a good strategy, so Paramount won't risk it on one of their bigger and more anticipated films like Top Gun Maverick and Sonic the Hedgehog 2. Honestly, I feel like it is a great a great idea as well. And honestly, I think this really is for the best. And I don't think it's really for that strategy of like low risk of using this instead of like the bigger, you know, the bigger movies like uh, Top Gun or Sonic or stuff like that. I think the biggest reason it really is because of the case of the pandemic. I mean, like considering that they are aiming for the youngest target uh, for the youngest target audience, those are the last people that would need to go and get the vaccine as well. I don't know if we even have any confirmations if the vaccines are even safe uh, for kids that are 12 and under, especially uh, for toddlers and for babies and for those group of people as well. Like, we still need to have a bit of testing. So for those young kids, if they have yet to receive their uh, vaccines, even when Paw Patrol would come out, at least it is a safer way to go and put it on digital and on Paramount Plus so 
that they could safely go and actually watch Paw Patrol the movie without having the risk of going into a movie theater and possibly catching COVID as well when they're not prepared uh, to go into the outside world as of yet. So that's definitely something that I definitely do applaud uh, Paramount for doing so. That, uh, that, and also, I'm really glad uh, that they would release it digitally and on Paramount Plus as well, because that also means that I, like, when I would have to go and review this movie, I don't have to go into the big screen and awkwardly be that childless millennial going to the, going to the movies all on his own to watch freaking Paw Patrol the movie. I don't have to be that person anymore. Hip, hip, hooray. <laughs> all right, so I'll go and read one more comment before we, um... Uh, before we go into our final story, uh, let's see now. Um, uh, who else do we have? All right, I'll, I'll go. Uh, oh, actually, oh, uh, here we go. I'll, I'll go with this one. Paw Patrol, the movie trailer, looks relatively harmless. The movie will definitely aim for little kids or even fans of Paw Patrol, since all of us are too old for that preschool show anyways. Also, I think the animation from that trailer looks way better than what I saw from Spirit Untamed and trailers from Boss Baby 2, so I wouldn't mind checking it out, despite who its target audience f is for. It'll be fine, so I don't mind. Yeah, and I think, uh, actually, you know, I'll, I'll read one more comment, actually. This one seems interesting, too. I saw bits and pieces of the series, so uh, I had some knowledge of the franchise. The trailer is... Eh... I know this movie is for a younger demographic, so it is whatever. However, if there's one thing I'm kind of concerned about this movie is the director of the film is the same one who did The Nut Job 2 and Escape from Planet Earth. But then again, you gotta keep in mind, yeah, it is from that director, but he is also doing a movie that is aimed for an audience that is much younger than something like Escape from Planet Earth and The Nut Job 2. And I mean, like... The thing is with those two movies, like, they're not the worst examples. I mean, The Nut Job 2 is just a really bland and forgettable sequel, while Escape from Planet Earth, while a disaster, yes, it's not really because of the director's fault. It's not because of that person in particular. It, there, like, I've, I've researched the history of it. I should know there's a lot more problems than just the director. So honestly, I'm not really concerned with that guy directing something like Paw Patrol the movie. I mean, like, I'm, sure, I'm confident he knows what he's doing. So I think it's going to be fine overall. And now it is time that we shall go into our grand finale. And originally, I wanted to do nothing but trailers for this uh, episode. I wanted to look into five different trailers and just talk about them all in one big shot. But what actually happened was that just yesterday, or the day before that I am recording this, they actually put out a massive news that I had to end up taking a deep breath and just say, okay, if I gotta talk about this, then I'll have to talk about this, because it does seem like a pretty big deal, and it is pretty relevant to what is currently going on in our pop culture. So with that said, why don't we go and actually talk about Cruella 2? Yes, folks, it is official. Disney has announced that they are going to be working on a sequel to Cruella, which, which uh, actually just came out last week. And uh, even though we don't have any confirmations about what it's going to be about or if there's going to be a new plot line or anything like that, or even if uh, which actors are going to be coming back, uh, what we do know is that they announced this is going to be happening and they are going to try to bring back the director and the screenwriter as well. Uh, considering that we have been, uh, the, the movie has been receiving praise for the works, especially from the director Craig uh, Gillespie, uh, who, who did uh, the the directing job on this, as well as from uh, Tony McNamara, uh, Disney will see if they can bring them back in order to do the sequel of Cruella 2. And uh, the big reason why they want to go and do a sequel, of course, is regarding the success of Cruella, uh, especially regarding the fact that this is one of the most praised Disney live action remakes in recent years. Like if you do look in, um, if you do look on Rotten Tomatoes right now, it actually does have a pretty solid score 
of 74%, as well as an audience score of 97%. Uh, not to mention that it seems like it's also doing financially well uh, uh, also, where apparently at the box office, uh, according to my source on The Hollywood Reporter, right now it has about $48.5 million at the box office, and apparently... With the premium access on Disney+, Plus, it's actually going extremely strong. How strong is it? Well, nobody knows, because Disney would not want to go and share the numbers. And apparently this is not really just a, uh, a Disney thing, by the way. Uh, apparently they even stated, I think there's somewhere in this article, uh, they or I, I read actually somewhere where they said that Apparently, this is just something that streaming services do. They just don't reveal the numbers on the uh, success that these movies have done or like how much did they make in terms of like that kind of premium access or anything like that. In other words, uh, the, the these streamings, they would have a bit of a Republican approach to, uh, to the success or to determine what is considered a success. They would just say that it was successful in streaming and provide no other form of evidence, where they would just go and say, We are so glad that Cruella was a major hit on Disney+. Plus." Oh really, how much did it make? How many, uh, how, many subs uh, how many premium access purchases happened? We're not gonna say it! You'll just have to take our word for it! <laughs> <laughs> uh, but in all seriousness, though, um, there is also a comment that we do have here from a Disney spokesperson uh, where they stated about the announcement about making a Cruella sequel in which they stated here... <clears throat> Uh, let's see. Uh, we are very pleased with Cruella's box office success in, in, in conjunction with its strong Disney Plus premiere access performance to date. The film has been incredibly well received by audiences around the world with a 97% audience score on Rotten Tomatoes in addition to A's in every demographic from Cinema Score on opening weekend, ranking it amongst the most popular of our live action reimaginings. Re we look forward to a long run as audiences continue to enjoy this fantastic film. And that is so far the big news about Cruella 2 is the fact that Disney wants to make a sequel as, as a response to the big success and they might be bringing back the director and the screenwriter in order to work on this sequel. Now, I've already released my review of the uh, Cruella movie and I'm going to be very honest, I gotta say that I genuinely liked this movie actually. I do find it to be one of the better Disney live-action remakes. Now, granted, I will say that it is definitely not a perfect movie or even a great movie, because there are some stupid elements that are in there. Like, yeah, it has a bit of a predictable story, and yes, like, um... I'm sure we are at the point where a lot of people already know what this is. You've probably read it on social media, but for me, yes, I'm one of those people that did burst out laughing when Cruella's mom died because Dalmatians pushed her over a cliff. So, like, yeah, that I already, yeah, like, that I will agree was absolutely stupid. But I will say, if you have seen the movie, then I will say that I don't think that scene is the craziest moment in the film. There's this one plot twist that is just, e that I feel like is even more insane than that little moment in the opening. And also, I do feel like when it comes to the, um, when it comes to the references to the original 101 Dalmatians, I just feel like it is massively forced. I feel like the less that you do connect Cruella to the original, to, uh, 101 Dalmatians, the better that it actually is. Because I feel like it is much better as its own thing than a legitimate 101, Al uh, 101 Dalmatians adaptation. Because the, the references do feel very forced. And and they feel like they do, they feel very much out of place for this kind of movie. Like, did we really need Roger and Anita in this movie? And I mean, like, their char like I see the point of their characters, but did they have to be Roger and Anita? You could name them Sher like you could name them Laverne and Shirley, and it would pr it would not change a single thing. Like, it just feels weird the fact that they have to forcefully cram in having something from 101 Dalmatians. I mean, like, we did, we, I, I just feel like we don't need that. Uh, like, yes, I do get it. It's supposed to be, like, this prequel that shows the origins of Cruella de Vil. 
but this is not necessarily the same Cruella de Vil that we know from the animated film or even the Glenn Close version from 1996. This is supposed to be an entirely different character on her own. And I feel like the more that it's trying to be its own thing, the better that it actually is. And that is exactly why when it comes to this uh, idea that we are getting another Cruella movie, I honestly feel very much mixed because and that that's mainly because of how I kind of do feel mixed with some of the good and the bad of the Cruella uh, of this Cruella movie because like I said I would definitely be open to a sequel to a Cruella sequel mainly because of how well the Cruella movie is mainly because that it, it, it has so many elements that actually really did work out well. Like, I do agree, the director really did a fantastic job in this, but I also really do admire the cast in this movie. I feel like that seems to be extremely rare that we would have a, uh, a Disney live-action remake in which all the actors did a very good job. Usually, when we would have these kinds of movies, uh, normally there would always be that one or two actors that would be just flat-out terrible. Like, they would just stand out on how horrible their performance performances and like how it is such a massive downgrade compared to their animated count counterparts rather it be like uh, Jafar from the Aladdin remake or Elle Fanning in the Maleficent movies just to go and name a few but in this movie here in Cruella I cannot think of a single character or a single actor that did a bad job every single actor from Emma Thompson Emma Stone the guys playing a uh, horse and Jasper like all those guys did a phenomenal job with their performances and really making their characters likable and especially with, with the way that this is a more character driven movie like yeah I would definitely be down to see a sequel to see more of that dynamic between Cruella de Vil and Horace and Jasper and see all the little uh, schemes that they would go and try to pull off or like whatever big plan that they would have in order to present Cruella de Vil as this major newfound fashion icon that would overthrow the Baroness. Like, I, like, honestly, I would be down to see more of that, to see more of those character dynamics. Like, that would be a great thing to have with the sequel. But then there is also another thing that does make me extremely doubtful with this uh, Cruella sequel, and that is regarding the fact that, technically, when you do look at Cruella... It is technically a prequel to 101 Dalmatians. Now, does that mean that with this Cruella sequel, will it be more of a direct adaptation of 101 Dalmatians? And that's the big thing that I am concerned about. Are we going to see more connections to 101 Dalmatians? Because those, like, like I said before, those are the elements that I do feel like we are absolute that they are absolutely forced. And by the way, this is a little bit. This is this is a spoiler to 101, uh, not, not 101 Dalmatians, but this is a spoiler to Cruella, but I, I'm just going to say right now, at the end of the movie, like after the credits, well, not directly after the credits, but like in the mid credits, there is actually a scene where you do actually catch up with what's going on with Anita and Roger, which with uh, Anita, who's just taking a break from her journalist job and Roger, who was fired from being the lawyer of the Baroness and Cruella decided to give those two a gift, which are, believe it or not, Dalmatian puppies. Roger ended up receiving a new Dalmatian puppy named Pongo, and Anita actually got a new Dalmatian puppy named uh, uh, uh Per. What is it? Pongo and per uh, and named uh, Perdit. She got a, a a Dalmatian puppy named Perdita. And then that's where he, where Roger got the idea of the song where he's on his piano singing Cruella de Vil, Cruella de Vil, if she doesn't scare you, no evil thing will. 
that that and, and honestly that that's just a really stupid part that again is another force element that we did not need in Cruella to make a reference to 101 Dalmatians and what I am worried about the sequel is that they would keep on continuing that forceful uh like uh, like the, the the forceful references to 101 Dalmatians that like now that we are going to have the sequel are, are we going to be like subjected to seeing like how Roger and Anita met and how the Dalmatian pup bonded them together like do we like would we need to have that scene like do we need to have those elements do we need to have that movie recreate those scenes from the 1996 movie and the original animated feature honestly I'm just not down for that and I want more of the original aspects that Cruella has delivered us instead of more of the like trying to be the live action remake of 101 Dalmatians and overall, that's where I honestly feel very mixed. And, and not to mention also, uh, like one more thing I forgot to mention is the fact that the, 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 the way that things are currently going right now when it comes to these Disney live action remake sequels, oh boy, they're not, they, they don't do well. Like even though we only have two technically, we got Alice Through the Looking Glass and we also got Maleficent Mistress of Evil. Both of these movies are just absolutely garbage. So it does give me some serious doubt of the fact that Disney wants to do a whole lot more of these live action remake sequels with uh, like they already got one planned for like the Jungle Book, the Lion King. I think Aladdin is also getting one as well. So the fact that they're also doing one with Cruella, I, 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 for me, I feel like it is very easy uh, to see how it could turn out to be a disaster. But overall, I just feel massively conflicted with the fact that we would end up getting another Cruella because on one hand I actually did like the original movie I well I actually do like this uh, Cruella movie I think it's one of the better Disney live action remakes and I really love a lot of the aspects in there like the directing the acting and even the uh, the visuals as well the beautiful production design the great costumes uh, the fantastic cinematography it is a visually beautiful feature so that is something that I would definitely be down to go and check out but then again, there are also those flaws that I am worried about that could also return and could even return in full force now that we are now that the sequel could be entering into the realm of the storyline of 101 Dalmatians. So that's why I feel very iffy on this. But ultimately, the thing is, is that this has just been announced and we will have to wait and see with what they could have in store with this Cruella sequel. Maybe it's a good idea, maybe not, but you never know. We'll, we'll, we'll just wait and see with what happens. All right, so with that said and done, uh, let us now go into uh, the chat wall. And I would like to ask you all, how do you feel about uh, a Cruella sequel? Are you guys on board with this? Are you guys against this idea? Let me know what you all think about this. Okay, so, let's see now. I actually love the first Cruella, so I'm really interested to see what they're going to do with the sequel, given how the first movie ended. Also, I think they should call the movie DeVille. Oh, uh, that could be an idea. Eh, well, we'll see. Uh, we're, we're doing a sequel. How hard can it be? We can't do any worse than The Godfather 3. Oh, uh, cute little reference. Oh my God. I Say what you will about Muppets Most Wanted, but I think it has one of the best Muppet soundtracks in any of their movies. Uh, let's see what else we have. Anyone notice a bit of a double pattern with a 101 Dalmatians franchise? We got two 101 uh, a a animated films, including Patch's London Adventures, two live-action 101 Dalmatian films starring Glenn Close, two animated series of 101 Dalmatians, and now we're going to have two Cruella films starring Emma Stone. Can you name another franchise that was rebooted twice? Each film between rebooting had a sequel and two animated series. Well, I will say with the animated series kind of thing, I mean, that is a bit of a different story because, yeah, the, 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 the first animated series, that was in response to the success of the 1996 film. 101 Dalmatian Street, however, that's more of its own thing. That's not like a response to like being a sequel to the 101 Dalmatian series of the 90s or, 
Ooh, excuse me. <laughs> that thing tried to come out weirdly. Or what in the case of uh, or it's not trying to be a response to the success of Cruella. Just want to go and uh, put that out there. All right, let's see. Cruella getting a sequel is not a surprise, although I wonder if this sequel that Disney is developing will be better or worse than what we're than what we have for both Maleficent and the Alice sequel, since the latter two were awful. Also, if Cruella was a success on Disney's Plus, then Raya, Raya probably didn't do well on Disney Plus since, bus, uh, since Business Insider did confirm late back in March where it made less money than what the Mulan remake made, apparently. Any thoughts? That could be a possibility, but there's a part of me that honestly doubts that. I mean, it's hard to really imagine that the Raya sequel would have less interest than the Mulan remake on Disney+. Plus. And the reason why I have so much doubts is mainly because of the fact that Raya and the Last Dragon is Disney's first movie where they tried this format of releasing it both in theaters and also on Disney+. Plus. And the thing is, is that immediately afterwards, like sometime afterwards, they decided they're going to do the same format as well with Cruella and with uh, Black Widow. And just recently, they did the same thing with the Jungle Cruise. If Raya and the Last Dragon was not a success, then they wouldn't go and do that same kind of uh, format with stuff like Cruella and especially with Black Widow. Like they would just like if if Raya really was a failure, then they would just stop right there. The, like they would just stop that format right there and they would just strictly stick with just releasing it in theaters or just releasing it exclusively on Disney Plus with just having the uh, premiere access. So that's why I am a little bit doubtful of Raya being a failure, especially on Disney Plus. Because, like, right now, why are all these other movies following Raya's format instead of following Mulan's format? That's all I'm asking. Again, these are all theories, and I and I understand I could be wrong. But still, I just feel like because we don't have the facts, it just feels like well, there's a lot of holes with the logic with what Disney's strategy is going on. Well, let's see now. I do really enjoy the movie, and Emma Stone did a pretty solid Cruella, even though it's no better than, uh, it's not better than Glenn Close's Cruella. Uh, I thought the movie was better than Maleficent, but it's not a great movie to what the Jungle Book remake had. But I feel like making a Cruella sequel is kind of not what we're expecting for, uh, because I'm kind of afraid that it will end up like Maleficent, Mistress of Evil, and Alice Through the Looking Glass, because that's just my perspective on it. I mean, it's a fair perspective, definitely. Uh, let's see what else we have here. Well, I was not expecting the, uh, did I read this one? Okay, yeah. No, I didn't read this one. Well, I was not expecting this. While I did enjoy Cruella, I definitely agree with you that I feel very mixed about the decision on, on one hand. There are a lot of great potential for the dynamic between the characters, but on the other hand, I am worried that this could just feel like more of another live-action remake of 101 Dalmatians. Also, when this sequel happens, can the Dalmatians please not look like hilariously bad CGI creatures? Yeah, that's also another thing. Like, that's my one complaint about the visuals is that as beautiful as it looks, the CGI on the dogs are just laughably bad. <laughs> All right, I'll go and read uh, one more comment before we cap this off. Well, um, <laughs> well, Carella DeVille is sexy in this movie and was based off of a good book called Hero Hello, Cruel World. So I am all for it, and uh, hopefully they do something unique like the Glenn Close version did with combining the original book with the home with Home Alone. But uh, what to say? Hopefully it'll uh, it, it'll force any more elements in the movie in the in the movie. So yeah, I think at this point uh, the best we can do is just hope for the best if they really are gonna make uh, another Cruella Deville movie. I mean like. They did have a good start so far with uh, the first Corella. Maybe the second can follow suit. And with that said, that should do it for this episode of Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast. So I just would like to say thank you all so much for listening. And thank you all so much for watching. And hopefully by next week we will actually have some animation news. And some entertainment news that we can legitimately discuss about. Hopefully it won't be as dry as this week. So with all that said and done, I would like to say thank you all so much for listening. Thank you all so much for watching. And until next time, see you later dudes.